Good morning, everyone. It is Saturday, March the 6th, 2021. It is currently 9.08 a.m. Central Time, and I'm coming to you live from Victory Baptist Church, located right here in Ovalo, Texas. And we're going to be spending probably an hour, probably about an hour, talking about something that is sure to spark some controversy, but that is not my intention, all right? I'm going to have to spend... I'm going to have to spend a considerable amount of time here at the beginning to really explain what I'm trying to do because people are going to misunderstand, misrepresent, and so I need you to listen to me carefully right here at the very beginning so that you understand what I am going to be doing, all right? We're going to be taking, we're going to be using something that is currently going on. There, there's, there's some controversy currently swirling around, and we're going to take that controversy And we're just going to simply use that controversy to get to a deeper issue. Now, what everyone's going to do, they're going to stop with the controversy. And they're immediately, they're going to throw in their two cents about the controversy. And if you do that, you're missing the point. I want to talk about something deep. I think the controversy is a good starting point to get to this deeper issue. But everyone's going to want to talk about the controversy. And let me state it again. That's not my intention. I'm not here to deal with the controversy. I'm simply here to use the controversy to get to this deeper question, this deeper issue. And this deeper question, this deeper issue is very straightforward, very simple. If you pay attention, you'll understand. Are you ready? Here is the deeper issue. When it comes to the qualifications of an elder, are Christians, are churches using Scripture alone to determine how to, to, to figure out what these qualifications are and how, how this works when someone violates one of these qualifications? Are, are, are Christians and churches using Scripture alone to deal with the subject of the qualifications of an elder, or are they relying, listen to me carefully, on the hermeneutic of tradition? So let me state it again. Are churches using Scripture alone to deal with the subject of qualifications for an elder, or are Christians and churches using the hermeneutic of tradition? And when I say the hermeneutic of tradition, let me define what I mean. There, within Christianity, at times, a traditional interpretation of a text arises. It's just the way these people understood it that way, and then the next generation just takes up that understanding, and it just kind of becomes a part of the, the culture of Christianity, and no one ever calls it into question. It's like, that's the way you understand that passage. That's the way you understand that passage. And everyone just starts kind of using it that way. Let me give you an example. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me, right? How many times within Christianity do you hear that verse quoted in ways that has nothing? I mean, if you go and look at the actual text and look at the context, it doesn't mean that, hey, I'm a Christian and I've got a Tomorrow, I've got to, you know, do my uh, physical fitness test for the military, and I've got to run my you know, mile and a half, two mile run in less than 13 minutes or whatever the time is. Well, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Hey, I've got to take this test tomorrow. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Is that the way that verse is to be used? Is that, is that, is that how it was meant? But that becomes a hermeneutic of tradition. Within Christian tradition, that verse is just used that way over and over and over again, so it kind of becomes the default position, all right? In Jeremiah, where we read of God knowing, I know the plans I have for you to bless you and to do you know good to you. I'm, I'm paraphrasing the passage. Uh, people will think, oh, that applies to us today, and it's it's... It's used, you know, God, God, God knows the plans he has for you, and it's to, to bless you and to do good, good for you. And that's quoted at graduations, and it's quoted all over the place. And you go look at the actual context, you're like, no, this was God speaking to the people in Babylonian captivity. Come on, let's, let's get this correct. But there becomes a hermeneutic of tradition, just a traditional way of looking at it. And I apologize, I'm just paraphrasing some of that, but uh, because of time, I don't want to sit there and go look at these passages up and work through all of them and do an exposition. Um, You just know that there are passages in Scripture, I'll just state it this way, there are passages in Scripture that the interpretation, the understanding of those passages and the application of those passages are based off just a tradition 
that is alive and well within Christianity, not actually based off scripture alone. It's not the scripture speaking, it's tradition speaking. All right. And as sometimes as non-Catholics will say, no, we don't rely on tradition, but tradition is alive and well in, in every church that you know, in every part of Christianity. That's just the way people handled that text, and it becomes the default position in the way we handle that text. So when it comes to the subject of qualifications of an elder, are we relying just on Scripture alone, or are we relying on just kind of a traditional understanding of that subject? And we got a, we've got Scripture, there's no question. There's scripture that speaks of the qualifications of an elder, but is our understanding of that based off that scripture, listen to me, state it again, alone, or is it based off tradition mixed with that scripture? So when we read that scripture, what we tend to actually do is we're actually reading our tradition upon the text. I think there's a lot of tradition thrown into this whole idea of qualifications of an elder. And I think, and sadly, I think sometimes qualifications of an elder becomes a weapon just utilized to attack someone you don't like. If you don't like a person, hey, here's the qualifications of an elder, right? And you're going to make it work and you're going to find something that they're guilty of and say they should be removed. But if you like the elder, if you like the pastor, if you like uh, the teacher, you're like, well, okay. Well, I mean, the, the scripture seems to imply that, but I, I don't think it means that they can never be a pastor again. And so it, it really comes down to if you like the person or don't like the person. And when that happens, that should make everyone stop and go, wait a minute. It shouldn't work that way. That's, that's not very godly that, that, that we go to the text and if we don't like someone, we can find something that they've done in violation of one of these one of these standards, and then we can call for their removal. But if we, if we like the person, we can find a way that, that this text doesn't actually remove them from the past, being a pastor, an elder, et cetera, et cetera. I think we play a little game. Let, let me, I, I, I used this illustration before. Let me use it again, all right? And hopefully this will uh, help you understand my, my concern with qualifications of an elder. I think there, I'm just, I'm concerned with the way so many Christians and churches handle this. And with, within the current controversies that we're going to, getting ready to be talking about, you're going to see how this is playing playing out. All right, now listen to me carefully. Let me give you uh, this story. When I was in the United States military, I was put in charge, ah, how many people were, were working for me? 14 people, 16 people, I can't remember. It was a, a large number of people. And the, the United States military at that time, the leadership, they loved to give me the troops that had all kinds of problems, right? People that had been in trouble, people, I, I, I mean, you name it. They, and they, they, they thought for some reason that I could either help these individuals, fix these individuals. But I kind of, I kind of liked it. I kind of like, oh, these are the people that you all think are useless and worthless and you don't like and you want them kicked out of the military. You go ahead, hand them to me. I kind of like having, I like having the troops that everyone thought were useless. I, I kind of like that challenge because I think in many cases there was, there, that the people who had kind of thrown these troops under the bus and saying that they were useless, they just, they just didn't like them. It was a personality thing because in many cases, some of these troops were the best troops that anyone could ever have. But one such troop, she was a female, and she was, I guess, a professing Satanist, all right? At sometimes she was a Satanist. Sometimes she was an atheist. I don't know. And, and they, I think they were like, oh, he's going to school to be a pastor. Oh, this is going to be, I think they almost thought it was going to be some like, War and I'm like, no, I have no problem. I get, I, I don't have a problem. I usually get along fine with lost people. It's, it's other Christians that I usually have my conflict with. Okay, but because, but uh, yeah, we, we'll get into all of that. Okay, but so fine. So she started working with me. Everything was great. But the leadership hated her guts. They wanted her gone. They didn't like her. They thought she was weird. They just wanted her gone. They were looking. They were looking for an excuse. They were looking for an excuse to get rid of her. And I was like, no, leave her alone. She's great great worker. She's great. No. And I, and we got along fine and she was great, but there were people out there to get her. So here's what happened. Now you got to go back in time here. The, the internet, as far as being on all of the military computers was a, a, a new thing. And when I say the internet, the internet is, as giving you the ability to search the world wide web, right? To, to, to go, you know, surf the internet. I know kind of a dated term, but you get the idea. That was kind of a new thing. 
So, then, so all of a sudden, and all of our computers, you, there it was. There was an internet browser, and boom, you could launch and just go anywhere you want on the internet. Now, the internet was still relatively new, but it was this you know, cool thing. You're at work, and you could just go search for this, search for that, search for this. And, and people were going crazy. People were going crazy. They were searching for everything. And, of course, you can probably tell where this story is getting ready to go. Obviously, a lot of people started using the Internet to look at pornography. I mean, it's just a sad state. Uh, it's just the way it is. It's just the reality of it, okay? It's just the reality. Uh, the Internet is this great tool, but it's used a lot for pornography, and to deny that is just insane, all right? And we could have a long discussion about pornography, but we won't get into that here. But the bottom line is people were using it. And we're talking, when I say people, higher-ups commanders were using it and they were downloading large quantity of pornography onto their computer and it became a big thing and there and so finally it was like because there was no filter there was nothing blocking where you could go or what you could look look at and so it was like hey guys girls ladies men all of you this has got to stop all right you cannot use your government computer for pornography so they basically made it very clear that, the, that, that on a government computer, you can only use the Internet for official government business, period. That's the only thing you can use it for. Now, it made no sense why you would place an Internet browser on everyone's computer when really no one had any reason to be surfing the Internet because you, you didn't even – like at that point in time, you didn't really think, well, how could I use, what could I look up on the internet? How could I, what could I use the internet for to help me in my job? Like it, it made no sense. Like 90% of the people had no need for an internet browser, but they put it on all the computers. But they told us you can only use it for official government business. But it was kind of said like, hey guys, you can only use it for official government business. Wink, wink. Basically, that means don't look at pornography. All right. So they, they gave us that warning. And the next thing you know, guess what? Everywhere you went, people were on the Internet. It doesn't matter where you went. You could go into the first shirt's office. You could go. It doesn't matter where you go. And I, I'm you know, just using some military terminology, but it doesn't matter where you go. People were on the Internet looking at something. All right. People were on the Internet. So it's like everyone was using it as long as you basically you stayed off pornography or if you weren't looking up, you know, directions on how to make a bomb. Basically, it, nobody cared, okay? And as, and as long as you were doing your job, basically it was just kind of like, okay, here it is. Come on, just just be smart about what you're doing, okay? Everybody got it? All right. And so it was kind of an unstated rule that it was perfectly okay to use the internet as long as you were doing your job and you weren't looking up, you know, you weren't downloading pornography. That was basically the way, even though the rule was clearly stated, that's kind of the way it was enforced, all right. So it wasn't solo rule. It was kind of like, hey, you, you get the spirit of the of the rule, right? You got it. OK. And so everyone operated that way. And, and basically there was no problems. Then what a year, year and a half. The Internet was obviously far more developed. There was far more things to look at on the Internet. And it was just it just kind of become a part of everyone's life. It was just there. Well, my troop. All right. The, the, the airmen that everyone disliked, the airmen that everyone hated. Well, one night uh, she had she had just bought a new CD, and for some reason the lyrics weren't inside the CD. I know I'm, this is dated. I understand, and so she was like, "I'm going to look up the lyrics online." So she looked up the lyrics online, and she hit print. For some weird reason, she forgot that she had print. She forgot. We all went home that night. We worked uh, the night shift. Uh, we all went home, and all of a sudden in the morning, I get a phone call. Hey, you need to get uh, in, in full service dress. You need to contact your airman. You need to be at the first shirt's office in, in about three hours. Be standing outside the door, um, you know, at attention. We'll call you in. So we get there. We called in. Guess what's sitting on the first shirt's desk? I, th I think that I may have been the commander's desk. I don't remember. Guess what? We get called in. Guess what's on the desk? Those lyrics that she printed out. Someone found them the next morning looked and said, uh-oh, someone's using the internet for something they're not supposed to. Bad, 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 bad. Okay, so then they got to go tell. Even though that person who found it, clearly they're on the internet all the time as well. But hey, we're going to use the rules now because we don't like this person. So they, they took it to the systems office. The systems office was able to look at who, who's, 
who's, you know, they were able to look at it and figure out who gave the command for something to print on that printer at what time. And they traced it back and go, oh, it was this computer. And here's the user who used that computer. And lo and behold, it was my airman who the leadership did not like. So then they were like, that's it. We're going to take her down. We're going to take her down for utilizing a, 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 com- a computer for something other than official government business. They were going to end her military career. They were going to basically try to finish her for basically misuse of government equipment. And I remember standing there looking at them going, this is insane. This is wrong. I said, let's call the systems office and I want a full history on, on uh, and uh, it was either the commander for sure. I want a full history on your computer. Do you ever use it for anything other than official government business? Everyone in this hospital does. Everyone in this building does. It's a joke to try to now use this rule to take her down. You're using the rule because you don't like this person. You're not even giving her a chance. You're not even offering, you know, like, hey, we're going to reprimand you. No, they were really trying to end her military career. So it became a big controversy. I was able to, I was going to make enough noise and fight it long enough that I was able to at least save the troop. I think she got a letter of reprimand. So it's, they still tried to hurt her uh, and still try to hurt her career. But it was just, just insane. Here's the rule. Nobody was following the rule. Because the spirit of the rule was basically don't look at pornography and don't be sitting there looking at the internet when you're supposed to be doing your job. But it had turned into now here's a rule that we can use to get rid of someone we don't like. And I think sometimes within Christianity, these qualifications of an elder, these rules are used in very questionable ways. All right. Now, that that's my so make sure you understand i'm i'm starting this by giving you my premise and again let me make sure I, kind of my thesis as christians as churches do we rely on scripture alone when dealing with the subject of qualifications for an elder or do we rely on the hermeneutic of tradition hey this is traditionally the way we look at these rules and this is the way we apply the rules but it has nothing to do with scripture alone it's just something to do with our tradition or even worse Do we simply use the rules when they benefit us and they can hurt someone we don't like, but we don't consistently apply the rules the same for everyone? Right? Everybody got that? Now, let's get to the controversies. There are three controversies. All three controversies surround John MacArthur, Grace Community Church, and the Master Seminary. You can read about all of these controversies at, and I've got the... uh, I've got to grab my iPad over here, right? Uh, The Roy's Report, R-O-Y-S Report, The Roy's Report, R-O-Y-S. Now, if you want to go to the website, it is Julie, J-U-L-I-E, R-O-Y-S, J-U-L-I-E, R-O-Y-S, all run together, J-U-L-I-E, R-O-Y-S dot com. J-U-L-I-E-R-O-Y-S dot com, Julie's dot, Julie Roy's dot com, if I can state that correctly. Again, it's called the Roy's Report, R-O-Y-S, all right? And the the tagline for this website is reporting the truth, restoring the church, reporting the truth, restoring the church. Her goal is to restore the church by simply reporting the truth of what's going on in many of these large ministries. And lately, she has definitely been doing a lot of reporting about things surrounding John MacArthur, Grace Community Church, and the Master Seminary. Now, you can have your opinion about all of these reports. You can can read them for yourself. You can draw your own conclusions. I'm not here to attack MacArthur, Master Seminary. I'm not here really to deal with these controversies. But in the midst of all of these controversies, we keep finding this same issue coming up. That person's disqualified for the ministry. That person's disqualified. That person's disqualified. They should be disqualified. They should be disqualified. And I keep looking, I'm like, wait, really? So now someone's completely disqualified for the ministry for that? That's the way we're going to work this now? That's the way we're going to use these rules. Now, guess what? Those who hate John MacArthur, they're using, they're, they're, they're trying to use these rules to go after him. 
MacArthur and Master Seminary have used these rules in order to get rid of someone who was the, who was in charge of Master Seminary. So it's like both sides are using the same passage of, of Scripture to try to say, oh, that person's gone. No, no, they should be gone. No, they should be gone. And it's like, here's these rules, but are they being used based off Scripture alone? Are they being used consistently? Are they just used as a weapon to attack and get rid of someone we don't like? So let's go through some of these reports. I'm not going to go into great details, but I'm going to give you the three major reports where this all comes into play. All right, are you ready? The first one, here's the headline. This was published yesterday at 7.43 a.m. And you can go read it right now by going to julieroys.com. That's J-U-L-I-E-R-O-Y-S dot com. The first controversy deals with John MacArthur, and the story that he has told a number of times about Martin Luther King Jr.'s assass- assassination. All right? John MacArthur and the story he has told about Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination. And there's a question about the story that he has told many times. Is it true? There's st- there seems to be a, some major conflicts with the story John MacArthur has told and eyewitness accounts, letters, there's just some things like, wait a minute, John MacArthur, there's something not co- correct with your story, all right? Now, let me just read the first paragraph here. Did John MacArthur lie when he claimed to be the lone white guy with black civil rights leader, the ni- leaders, I should say, so let me read this again. Did John MacArthur lie when he claimed to be the lone white guy with black civil rights leaders the night Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated? Did MacArthur embellish the story, claiming to have arrived at the hotel where uh, Martin Luther King was shot just hours after? Um, and, and in fact, I'll just read this all again. I'm trying to break it down, but let me just read it co- uh, completely and then I'll break it down. All right, here we go. Here's the first paragraph. I won't stop. I keep stopping because I'm gonna, I think I'm going to say something, but then that kind of breaks up the flow. So I want you to hear it so it doesn't sound like I'm taking anything out of context. Here we go. Did John MacArthur lie when he claimed to be the lone white guy with black civil rights leaders uh, the night Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated? Did MacArthur embellish the story, claiming to have arrived at the hotel where um, Martin Luther King was shot just hours after uh, Martin Luther King's assassination when he actually arrived days later? Now, you can read the whole story. MacArthur has made lots of claims that he stood here, that he was there, that he arrived at this time. And then there's eyewitnesses and people are like, wait a minute, what is he talking about? That's not accurate. That's not accurate. That's not true. That's not true. That's not accurate. Now, you could argue, okay, well, maybe he's just not remembering things correctly. You, you could go, you could go all in. You, you could, you could, in other words, you could go all in and either accusing or defending. You could go all in saying, wait, 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 not everyone gets their story right. Uh, but then, of course, John MacArthur, MacArthur could just come out and clarify, wait a minute, okay, here's what I don't remember accurately. Here's what I do remember accurately. And then you could talk to the other eyewitnesses and see if they can get their stories to match, okay? And if their stories don't match, then what's going on? Is someone just completely misremembering or is someone perfectly... Uh, did someone purposely lie? Did some, someone purposely embellish the story to make themselves look more important, to make the story more exciting? We could ask all kinds of questions. We could go all in fighting about this. But let me just give you an example of what happens here. So here's this story, John MacArthur's story about Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination. And there's major questions. And these, these questions have been swirling around for years about, wait a minute, this story, this story does not quite sound right. These facts don't match up. They've, they've talked to eyewitnesses. There's supposedly a, a letter. There's all kinds of things going on. You can just read all of the accusations and all of the, uh, the opinions in regards to it. But look how what one person said. Are you ready? Here we go. After reading 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, and Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 15, it is quiet, quiet, clear, it is clear that the Grace Community Church elders must remove John MacArthur from the pulpit as he no longer meets the biblical requirements laid out in the scriptures. So according to this, if a pastor tells a story in print, behind the pulpit, and he embellishes the story, 
maybe just flat out lies, right? He's immediately disqualified and should be removed from the pulpit. Now, I have literally watched pastor, literally, I, I, I've watched this with my own eyes. I've watched this with my own eyes. A pastor, we, we, we went to a conference together. We're at a conference together. I was a teenager. The pastor took me to the conference. At that conference, someone told an illustration, a story about something that had happened in their lives. It was extremely sad. It was, I don't remember all the details, but it was extremely sad. That was like on a Friday or Saturday. Sunday, we're back at First Baptist Church in, the little, in a little Texas, West Texas town. The pastor stands behind the pulpit, tells the exact same story, <laughs> but, this, but he tells the story as it's something that had happened to him. In other words, he, may, he, he took someone else's story, made it about him, so he completely misrepresented. He was telling an absolute lie and for an, an emotional attempt to manipulate people. When we confronted him after, we were basically told that we're straining at a gnat. We're straining at a gnat. That, that the point is, if the story was powerful and it moved people to, to accept Christ, that's all that mattered. Now, to me, that's a straight up lie. And, and that excuse was horrible. And that gave me a horrible, you know, that gave me that kind of, that it had a major impact on how I viewed, you know, what happens behind pulpits. I have heard, I have heard preachers preach so many times and tell a story and they'll tell the story like it happened to them. And I'll be like, well, wait a minute. I've heard, I've heard another preacher tell that exact same story. I've heard a missionary tell that exact exact same story. And then you start asking, wait a minute, is that is that true? And and, and sometimes you can clearly tell that the story just just something doesn't, there's something just not right with the story. Now, when pastors do that, there should be no excusing that. If they're if they're telling a story and it's not accurate and it's not true and they're embellishing the story or exaggerating, there there's nothing there's nothing right about that. It is wrong and it must be condemned. And anyone who's ever spoken in public, you know how you can get caught up in doing that. The minute you start telling the story in front of a live audience, everything in you starts working in you to try to get you to tell the story in a more dramatic way, in a more entertaining way, because you're speaking in front of a live audience. And there, look, you, you can, maybe you understand it, maybe you don't. There's just something about when you speak in front of people, you want to hold that, that audience's attention. You want their response. And so when you start telling a story, you, you, you may start trying to make it sound a little bit more funny, a little bit more dramatic, whatever the case may be. And the next thing you know, whether intentional or unintentional, the story is not 100% accurate. You've embellished at some point. That is never right. The pastor must speak the truth. It's never right when an average Christian is telling a story and they don't get their facts straight. We always need to try to get our facts straight. We always need to speak the truth. That's what we should strive to do. But if a pastor does that, is that immediate, is that immediate grounds for removal from the pulpit? Is that when the elders should come along and say, you're finished and you're done? Let's say it comes out that MacArthur completely made up large segments of the story. Let's say that's, is that grounds for removal? Is that, is that grounds? Now, of course, uh, this person, he gave two passages that he looked at. So let's look at it really quick, right? We got to hurry. We got to go through these quick. So, so if, if a pastor basically doesn't tell a story or basically makes up a story or embellishes on a story, that's grounds to be removed from uh, the pulpit, right? According to how one person responded to this story. Let's look at it. First Timothy chapter three, verse one. This is a true saying. If a man desires the office of a bishop, uh, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless. Stop right there. Now, well, you're not blameless, obviously, if you tell a story and everyone can prove that the story is inaccurate. When you're dealing with something as important as the day that Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, you're dealing with a historical day, a historical event. And if you're telling that story and inserting yourself into the story, into the events immediately following the assassination, that's a pretty big claim. So if you, if you, uh, it's proven that you did not tell the story accurate, then you're not blameless, clearly. That, in other words, they've, gra they've got something to grab onto you for and make an accusation against you. And, these, and him telling the story was very public. So is that grounds for removal? Well, he, he wouldn't be blameless. 
Now, I want you to just realize, if you go with that, then basically any time a pastor does anything that anyone knows that's not correct or right, he wouldn't be blameless. So now the thing is, let's say he, he, he comes out and says, you know what? I told this story. I got caught up in storytelling. I, I was wrong. I apologize. I'm sorry. I repent. Then does that, is he now, so did he go from not qualified back to qualified by, by repenting? Is that the way it works or is it permanent removal? It's a permanent, re- for some things, people believe it's permanent removal. Just please note in 1 Timothy 3, scripture alone, it doesn't say what to do if someone violates this. 1 Timothy 3 doesn't say, hey, if you violate this once, you're finished forever. It does not give you those guidelines. That's where the hermeneutic of tradition gets involved. So let's go, get, let's go through the rest of these. So you must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy, a filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without. All right, now you don't have a good report of them with, without if it becomes public knowledge that you made up a story about your involvement with the events immediately, um, immediately following the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. You're not going to have a good, uh, a good report of those from without. You're going to be proven to be a liar. So does that mean you're disqualified from, from ministry? Um, he says, lest he fall into uh, reproach and the snare of the devil. All right. So uh, like, uh, so th- there we go. And then, of course, uh, the Titus is where the other passage occurs. Uh, Titus is the other place where this occurs. Um, let's see here. It's talking about the women. Let's see here. Where is he? Let me find out where. Let me let me look at the other passage that the person quotes. Give me one second. I want to make sure I give a, a, a look at both. All right, let me pull this up. Titus 1, 5 through 15 is what they offer up. So um, Titus, let's see, I'm in chapter 2. That's pro- part of the problem right there. I'm in the wrong chapter. Titus chapter 1. Here's, here we go. Verse 5. Uh, Titus chapter 1, verse 5. See, okay, um, here we go, verse six. So he says, uh, ordain elders in every city as I have appointed thee. And then this is Titus one, that's the end of Titus one five is about appointing elders. Then in verse six, if any be blameless, there's the blameless thing again, uh, the husband of one wife having faith, faithful children, not accused of riot, of riot or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, lover of hospitality, a lover of good, Men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as, as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. There you go. So the, what they're arguing is he would not, basically it seems like they would be arguing he would not be blameless and he would not have a good report of those from without because he would be proving to be a liar. So is that grounds to, for permanent removal from uh, the pulpit. Now, many people say absolutely not, because this is what you always hear. Okay, no, that's not grounds for removal. Okay, no, lying. That's no, that's not ground. He didn't commit. He didn't commit adultery. He didn't have an affair. Because we we always say sexual sin is the thing that removes you permanently, even though sexual sin by name is not even mentioned in First Timothy three or in Titus. It's not even specifically listed. We got other things that are specifically listed. Sexual sin. Now you can say sexual sin would apply to some of these things. Obviously, obviously, just like telling a lie about being involved with the events following the assassination of Martin, uh, Martin Luther King would, would also apply to some of those same, same things. But we would say, no, it's a different, it's different, it's different. Why? Are we relying on sola scriptura? Are we relying on the hermeneutic of tradition? So there's the first big controversy, all right? So there's one. We got to go through these quickly. So there's the first story. All right, now let's go, and this story is long. You can go look at all of it. They've got all the documentation. We're not going to go back through that. So, so um, again, the, the headline for that story, if you're looking for it, is John MacArthur's story about Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination true. Again, I'm not here to make any judgment. 
Not here to make any judgment. I just want you to realize that this is now leading people to say, hey, he should be removed. He should be removed because 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1. Right? Now, watch, watch how this plays out. All right. Let's go down to the next big controversy. Here we go. The next big controversy is Sam Horn resigns as president of the Masters University and Seminary, capping three years of tumult. All right, there's a lot of stuff buzzing around the Master Seminary and University. There's a lot of stuff going on. And one of the big things is the resignation of Sam Horn. Supposedly, some other people have resigned. I don't, there's just all kinds of stuff flying around. I don't know what's true, what's not true. Again, I'm using this for a deeper issue. Just stay with me. You'll see how this applies to the subject at hand. Dr. Sam Horn has resigned as president of the Master's University and Seminary, the school and university associated with John MacArthur's Grace Community Church. According to the school website, Horn submitted his resignation on Friday, but the change was not announced until Monday. Horn's resignation caps three years of tumult and transition at the Master's University and Seminary after the school was placed on probation in 2018 by its accrediting body. All right. And so so they, they, they were put on probation. There's been all kinds of things happening around there. All right. Now, if you could go all the way down, if you go all the way down, there was an update to the story. There's an update to the story. Now, listen carefully. Here's the update. The Roy's report has just received audio of the announcement of Dr. Horn's resignation giving in the chapel at the Master's University today. In the announcement, all right, it was implied that Horn resigned because of complaints. Are you ready? that he was quick-tempered or pugnacious and therefore disqualified from service as an elder. So supposedly there there were complaints that this person was quick-tempered and pugnacious, so therefore he's disqualified permanently, I guess permanently, from being an elder. Pugnacious and quick-tempered. And you have to sit there and go, no, wait a minute now. Wait a minute now, pugnacious and quick-tempered, someone who's argumentative seeming to be looking for a fight, uh, there was someone associated with Grace Community Church, I won't give the name of the individual in this, in this episode, but I had a, let's just say, we had a back and forth, we had a disagreement with this individual, and uh, I, I, there's no other way to describe this, that the person was very pugnacious and just looking to fight, just looking to argue, and then made accusations about my church, and he man, the man didn't even know me. It all started because this man made some comments in regards to John Lennon and his song, Imagine. And so I just gave a friendly, like, wait a minute. Now, based off interviews, based on things, I think I don't think you're representing what John Lennon was trying to say accurately. And I even said, I'm not defending the philosophy of the song. I just think we have to fairly represent what John Lennon was trying to say in the song. I don't think he was saying it the way you're saying. I don't think you're being fair. And the next thing you know, boom, I'm being attacked. And that my church, that our statement that we teach, you know, we, we're committed to the in-depth teaching of scripture and doctrine theology. Then he says, I doubt that that's true. You doubt that my church is committed to the in-depth teaching of scripture simply because I'm trying to correct your very poor interpretation of John Lennon's song, Imagine. Really? Uh, Yeah, so so you're going to attack. So now it became, he didn't want to deal with the actual song and all of the documentation about what John Lennon had said in regards to the song. He wanted to attack me. Is that not quick-tempered? Is that not pugnacious? So should he be disqualified from ministry? This man, who who was uh, the president... Uh, it, he had to step down uh, according to the to the audio that was what was spoken of in the chapel is because he was quick tempered and pugnacious. Therefore, he's disqualified. He's gone. Here's here's some quotes from it. You might remember first Peter five. It says we don't lord it over others and we don't exercise authority in a way that's quick tempered or pugnacious. You might remember that from Titus chapter one, verse seven, that is that is God's word. Those qualifications are non-negotiable. We understand that you can't bend on those things. We can't accept when people do. Those qualifications, the Master's University takes them very seriously because we recognize they, that, that, that they lie at the core of our credibility as spiritual leaders. 
Sadly, in recent weeks, significant concerns from multiple sources, faculty, staff, and students were raised about the nature of Dr. Horn's leadership among the lines that I just mentioned and strictly along those lines. Does this make sense to everybody? Do not read anything beyond it. Just the things that I just listed. These concerns were brought atten- uh, to the attention of senior administration, both at the Master's University and the Master's Seminary. They were shared with human resources, as well as the board of directors. Having been notified that these concerns had been raised, Dr. Horn determined that the best course of action was to submit his resignation, which he did last week. So he, concerns about being quick-tempered and pugnacious, and next thing you know, he's gone. There's all kinds of questions. Well, wait a minute. Who's been put back in charge? Has MacArthur been put back in charge? Well, if MacArthur's put, put Ben back, back in charge and we can prove that he lied about the events surrounding Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination and his being present, well, does that not disqualify him? Hey, this man was quick-tempered and pugnacious. He's gone. There's no bending the rules. So you, you, if you're ever quick-tempered, if you're ever pugnacious, you're just disqualified. Wait, is, is, that, is that the way this is supposed to work? Well, wait a minute, completely misrepresenting facts surround, uh, surrounding the events uh, associated with the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., that doesn't disqualify you? Now, so see how it's applied? These, these rules are non-negotiable. If you violate one thing in 1 Timothy or Titus, you are finished. So uh, do, you, do, you, do you see the problem here? How does this work? No, let's let's go to another story, right? So, and there's audio. If you go to the Roy's report, you can listen to the audio taken from the chapel service where the announcement is made. It's about six minutes long. I asked uh, Julie Roy's to send me a link so I could download this audio so that I could play it for you. She never did. She said it's available on SoundCloud. She's got an embedded SoundCloud player here, but if you click on it, it doesn't take you to any place where you can download the audio. So I can't download the audio. I could play it for you holding it up to the microphone, but that would just take too much time. Again, we don't want to get into all of the the details of these, these controversies. I just want you to see how all of these controversies deal with the same thing. Hey, MacArthur appeared to not get the story right, dealing with his involvement with the events associated with the assassination of Martin Luther King. This would not make him blameless. This would, would possibly make him a liar. This would definitely not give him a good report of those without because those who are without are giving statements going, MacArthur's lying. MacArthur's not telling the truth. All right, so does that just not disqualify him? Well, at the same time, while all of that's going on, at the Master Seminary, they get rid of the, the person in charge because supposedly he's quick-tempered and pugnacious, and there's nothing more to it. That's it. Don't read any more into it. That's what we're told. That's the only reason he resigned, because he's disqualified as an elder. Well, then who takes his place? MacArthur now is back in charge. Well, MacArthur's back in charge. If we're going to stick to these rules the same way, shouldn't he be disqualified? (laughs) See, see, these rules, these rules are just used arbitrarily to get rid of people when you don't like them. And then def- I, 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 I'm really having a hard time with how this works. But wait, let's go back to the Roy's report. There's another big controversy. This, re- uh, this re- uh, hang on, let me find it. This report, yeah, I got to load more here. All right. This report goes all the way back. Let's see, how far back does this one go? This one goes far back. I got to keep loading the stories. This one goes back to... Hang on, I got to get back. There's a lot. She's posted a lot. She posts a lot of things. So you'll have to give me a second while I I keep loading these stories to find it. Um, Here we go. Give me one second. Give me one second. Yeah. Oh, and then, okay. (laughs) We'll get into, we'll get into another controversy going on. Again, this is, uh, relates to John MacArthur, Grace Community Church. The director of John MacArthur's broadcast ministry, he doxed Julie Roy- Roy's and defends it. All right. Now, doxing means you put on the internet someone's personal information, like their address, their their home address, and their information, so that people then can possibly harass you. Well, it appears, according to what Julie Roy's is, re- is reporting, that the director of John MacArthur's broadcast doxed her. He, she, he posted on the internet her personal information because he's been defending John MacArthur because some of the things she's reporting. Well, is that, 
Is that ungodly to dock someone, to put someone at risk by giving out their personal information? Does that not disqualify him from being an elder? I guess not. I guess not. I guess that doesn't disqualify him. But hey, if you're quick-tempered and pugnacious, that can get you disqualified. You see how just arbitrarily this all plays out? Here we go. Here's the big story where a lot of controversy started. This was published all the way back on February the 3rd. Headline, The Prosperous Lifestyle of America's Anti-Prosperity Gospel Preacher. For decades, here's how the story reads. For decades, John MacArthur has railed on prosperity preachers, liking them to greed mongers who led first century cults. Recently, he's also taken aim at scandal-played evangelical leaders like the apologist Ravi Zacharias and former Hillsong pastor Carl Lentz, saying these celebrities were in ministry only for the money. That's why liars and frauds and false teachers are in business, MacArthur said in a recent sermon. False teachers always do it for the same reason, filthy lucre. Yet, according to financial statements and tax forms obtained by the Roy's report, John MacArthur and his family presides over a religious media and educational empire that has over $130 million in assets. So, hey, these people are in it for filthy lucre. These people are greedy. But yet MacArthur, again, according to tax forms, uh, presides over a religious media and educational empire that has over $130 million in assets and generates more than $70 million a year in tax-free revenue. MacArthur and his family and related companies have been paid more than $12.8 million from ministry and donor funds, and MacArthur has owns three luxury homes worth millions. Now, guess what? Someone's going to say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. First Timothy 3, First Timothy 3 says, are you ready? Let's, let's read it let's, uh, carefully. First Timothy chapter 3, verse 3, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre. Not greedy, not doing it for money. Now, well, then wait, wait a minute. You, you, you can draw your own opinions. Again, wait a minute. According to tax forms, he presides over a religious media and educational empire that has over $130 million in assets, generates more than $70 million a year in tax-free revenue, and that MacArthur and his family and related companies have been paid more than 128 million million dollars from ministry and donor funds, and MacArthur owns three luxury homes worth millions. Does that that make him guilty of that passage? Does that make him guilty? Now, please note, some will say yes, some will say no, 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 no. That's just saying don't be greedy. It doesn't tell you how much you can have. So again, sola scriptura, how are we using it fairly? There's been another controversy dealing with John MacArthur and the Master Seminary. Well, MacArthur has argued that the whole pandemic basically is not is not real, or there is no pandemic, I think is his exact words, and that this is all being used to persecute Christians. While that was all happening, two things occurred. One, Grace Community Church, the church received PPP loans from the government, but they did send them back. However, it appears the Master's Seminary received over a million dollars in PPP loans. Now, wait a minute. You can't be running out there saying you're being persecuted when the federal government sent you millions of dollars to help you keep your religious institution open. Is that being honest? Is that being truthful? Is that being accurate? Does that disqualify you from ministry? So you pl- what I want you to see is that so many times as Christians, we run around saying, sola scriptura, sola scriptura, sola scriptura. And then we, we didn't use sola scriptura. And then you see how conveniently we use it when it benefits us and how we avoid it when it doesn't benefit us. Hey, quick tempered and pugnacious, according to Master Seminary, there is no bending these rules. These rules are absolute. You, do, you're, you show that you're quick tempered and you're pugnacious, you're gone. At the same time, Phil Johnson, so part of Grace Community, Grace to you, part of the ministry, he docks someone. Well, is that not being 
pugnacious, quick-tempered? Well, like, who does that? Who does that? That that seems wrong. Yes, I, I would think that seems wrong. And at the same time, MacArthur's got very questionable things going on with his telling of the story about his involvement with the events following the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. Okay, well, it, if the story continues to grow, there's people out there saying this is not true. That doesn't make him blameless. Doesn't give him a good report. Does that make you disqualified? You, being greedy of money supposedly disqualifies you from ministry. His ministry is worth millions of dollars, and and we could we could even get into the story of the people that he has on his on his board, uh, on the board, and and it seems to be family members. People are, are accusing him of nepotism. There, you, his son was put on the board, and you could get into some of the things that his son had done. We can, we can, we. You'd start digging into all the details. You would be like, "Wait a minute, does this disqualify you?" Well, if you're a MacArthur fan, it doesn't disqualify him. Doesn't. He's not disqualified because you you love MacArthur. If someone else was to do some of these things, oh, that disqualifies them. You see how it works? These rules can't be just arbitrarily applied to who you like and arbitrarily ignored when it's so or, or, or they are applied to someone you don't like and they're ignored when it's someone you do like it can't work that way or possibly possibly if we just look at scripture alone the scriptures don't answer some very basic questions right let's consider some basic questions first timothy 3 gives us rules and titus gives us rules doesn't say what is to be done and anyway does not articulate anything what if someone violates one of these rules? If they violate one of these rules, are they permanently disqualified or temporarily disqualified? Does the text tell you permanent or, or temporary? Doesn't. Does it tell you what to do? No, we'd have to go to some other scriptures. The only other scripture I could think of is we could go to the Gospel of Matthew where it lays out what to do if, if, to, you know, if, if you've sinned against someone, there seems to be a, a way of trying to reconcile that. So if we apply that to this story, to this, then this is how it would work. All right, pastor violates one of these rules. The pastor is to be confronted in private, first and foremost. If the pastor repents, that seems to be the end of the story. If he will not repent, you bring two or three witnesses. If he doesn't repent there, you bring it before the church. If he doesn't repent, then strong actions must be taken. Strong actions must be taken. Now, listen, we're not talking about illegal activity. Illegal activity has to be reported to authority and then criminal prosecution must take place. We're not, we should never cover up illegal activity. Illegal activity is, that has to go too many times within the church. Illegal activities have occurred, sexual assault, sexual abuse, molestation of a child, and it's been covered up. That is horrible. We're not talking about that. We're not even dealing with that. Talking if the pastor is committed I, something that is, makes him guilty of First Timothy 3 or Titus 1, what should be done? The best we have is confrontation. If there's repentance, then there's restoration. The text doesn't say, well, guess what? No, no, he has to step down for six months. Text doesn't give you that. He has to step down for you. Text doesn't, where did you get that from? It has to be two years, has to be three years. Has to, where do you get that from? That is a hermeneutic of tradition. That is your tradition. Now, I'm not saying that that's necessarily wrong. I'm just saying you can't say that that's based off Scripture alone because Scripture doesn't tell you what to do. It says, here's the rules. All right, what, is it, what do you do if you violate the rule? Well, I guess if you violate, if you're quick-tempered and pugnacious, you're just removed, you're gone. But I guess if you dock someone, you're okay. I guess you, if you're greedy, you can be removed, but you can have be paid $12.8 million in, 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 in funds from your ministry and have three homes worth millions of dollars, and that's perfectly okay. That's not greedy. See, you see how arbitrarily the rules are, but I, I just want you to say, I want you to just realize from the text alone, remember, sola scriptura, it tells us here's the rules. The best we can do if someone violates these rules is to go to the Gospel of Matthew, where we were given at least some basic instructions. Private confrontation, repentance, over. No repentance, two or three witnesses. If, no, if repentance, over. If no repentance, bring it before the church. If no repentance, then, then the person is removed. Then the person is removed. And so, so how do you, how do you apply, how do you apply that? How, how do you, how does that work? 
Again, I, I've just seen it play out so arbitrarily. Like, okay, that person's removed. I, I've seen it just go back to all of the controversy that surrounded Mark Driscoll many years ago. All right. All kinds of things came out, plagiarism, all kinds of crazy things, right? There was an investigation, and then the elders of Mars Hill, they released a statement saying, yes, uh, Mark Driscoll did this, he did this, he did this. And some of the things they articulated sound like he clearly violated 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1. It clearly seems to say that he violated it. However, their conclusion was he wasn't disqualified from being an elder or from being a pastor. So he violates 1 Timothy 3, but he's not disqualified. And of course, then boom, he leaves Mars Hill and goes where? I think to Arizona to start a church, just leaves the church. I don't know what happened to Mars Hill. I think it it probably suffered uh, dramatically after he left instead of staying there. But again, does the text say he has to, the text doesn't give you any direction. So some people say Mark Driscoll was wrong. He was, I've heard people say he was disqualified. He was disqualified. He was disqualified. I've seen people say that a million times. He's disqualified. He's disqualified. Okay, according to what? That will, 1 Timothy 3. So if he so if he if he if he violated anything in 1 Timothy 3, he's disqualified permanently. He's disqualified permanently? Let's apply the same principle. So if anyone in the pew commits any sin, right? Are they immediately uh should be excommunicated? Or is there not a, a place for a confrontation, repentance, and restoration. Can a pastor be restored? Does, the Bible doesn't give a restoration process. It just says in Galatians that if someone is overtaken in a spiritual fault, fault, those who are spiritual, restore such a one. So there is restoration, but it doesn't say what that process looks like. Some people, and, and what's interesting is typically, in the at least in the American church, it's like 1 Timothy 3, some things are very specific here in 1 Timothy 3, right? Let's go, let's look at the things that are very specific. A bishop must be blameless, the husband of one wife. That's very specific. Now, there's not even agreement on what that means. Vigilant, sober, of good behavior, not given to hospitality, or given to hospitality, I should say, apt to teach, not given to wine, very specific, no striker, not greedy, all right, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, very specific, uh, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. I have seen and, uh, where pastors have literally been fired saying that they're no longer qualified to be a pastor because their 16-year-old gets involved in some sin or is rebellious. And then they're gone because they don't know how to rule their own house. So what, what does that mean? Like, does, how does that work? Does that work that way? How, how long does that apply? You get, you get into the stories about MacArthur and his son. His son, there was something really bad happened to his son. And you could, you could get into all of the, the, the details there. I'm not going to go into it now. Does that disqualify MacArthur? Well, like, well, once the son, like, how, how does that work? Now, once he's grown, it doesn't apply anymore. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, it doesn't apply anymore. But when, when they're, before they're uh, up to 18, if they do what? What disqualify? I see it's, it's specific, but it still leaves a lot of questions. So because it's so vague, anyone can just throw anything in there. That, oh, look, you're disqualified. You're disqualified. You're disqualified. And what I find interesting is in 1 Timothy 3 or Titus, there's no specific mention of any sexual sin specifically mentioned. But that's the one that well, everyone will say, that's it, disqualified forever. Are we relying on sola scriptura? Are we relying on our own traditional hermeneutic, our own traditional understanding of it? And we just apply it. That's the point. I want you to realize, I'm not making any argument. I'm not making any argument about MacArthur, about Master Seminary. I just want you to see that right now, these controversies are swirling around and a lot of people are running to 1 Timothy 3 and Titus to, to offer their declaration. Boom, gone, gone disqualified, disqualified. The same thing happened in, in the controversy surrounding Mark Driscoll. Disqualified, not disqualified, disqualified. Everyone has an opinion. Why? We have 1 Timothy 3. Isn't it clear? Clear. If we're going to go scripture alone, this is what we can, this is the conclusion we can arrive. Qualifications are listed. Yes. What, what else can we determine? That every pastor that's ever stood behind a pulpit is an imperfect man who's going to sin. 
And if you don't have a theology prepared for that, you're in trouble. They're a sinner and everyone in that church is a sinner. So there's got to be a place for forgiveness, for mercy, for restoration, right? If they violate one of these things, Matthew would seem to articulate that the way to handle it is confrontation in private. If there's repentance, then there's restoration. If it's a major sin, you could argue if there's a major sin, they need to step down and submit to the discipline of the church for whatever period of time the church agrees upon. But there's no scripture that says that. There's no scripture that outlines that process at all. It doesn't say you commit this six months probation or a year. You have to step down for a year and submit to. No, there's nothing that tells us that. So is it really sola scriptura? Now, each church should be able to design. Now, I think we have to agree this. Each church can design their own policies, right? Hey, here's how we're going to handle it. That church makes the determination. Now, can you sit there and say that church was wrong? Well, I don't like the way they did it. They're wrong. According to what scripture? What are you judging them on? See, we just, we come up with all of these rules that we just impose on people that really the text, the text doesn't give us that idea. I just find it interesting that there's all these things swirling around MacArthur and people are saying, hey, you're disqualified. At the very same time, Master Seminary just got rid of someone and their claim is he's disqualified. But yet, is MacArthur disqualified? Phil Johnson, his his back and forth with, with Julie Royce and doxing her and all, does is he not disqualified? I've seen plenty, plenty of accusations against Phil Johnson for being quick-tempered, pugnacious, argumentative, fighting a bully. I've seen lots of people that he's not blameless then if there, there's a... It, it, he doesn't obviously have a good report. So it, does that disqualify him? Some will say yes, some will say no. Guess what? Here's what I do know. John MacArthur is a sinner. Phil Johnson is a sinner. The person speaking to you behind this microphone today is a sinner. We've all done things that are wrong. We've all done things that probably violate 1 Timothy chapter 3. There's, I, we, I know I have, and I know other people have. Now, what, what's, what's the course of action? Well, there needs to be confrontation. Hopefully, there needs to be repentance. Sometimes you have to step down for a period of time. I think what you should do, I, what I personally think is that when a pastor has, there's a problem, he should step down and stay inside that church and that the church should work together to, to move him back to a place to restore him. That that just saying, oh, he messed up and then he walks out the door and goes somewhere else, I don't think is beneficial. The church has to, is it painful? Is it embarrassing? Is it filled with shame? Absolutely. But the, that's a part of the, that's a part of the reality that people in the pew are sinning. People in the pulpit are sinning. People are sinning. I'm not saying we excuse it, but we have to deal with it in a biblical way. I just think that this is a very interesting time where everyone's running around claiming disqualified, 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 disqualified. And, and some of the people saying disqualified would be guilty of the very passage that they're using to disqualify someone else. Everyone thinks they know how 1 Timothy 3 works. They think it works based off their tradition, not based off how the scripture outlines it. Scripture doesn't give any clear guidelines. This is the standard. Now, what happens if you violate that standard? Well, first we have to have a theology that says probably everyone's going to violate that standard because everyone's a sinner. In some way, shape, or form, you're going to violate it. Now, there's some things hopefully you could avoid. Hopefully, you know, the, uh, the, the, there's a lot of uh, attention in 1 Timothy 3 in regards to alcohol. If you look at 1 Timothy 3, I found, I found it very interesting. If you do a little study, um, you see, um, uh, a bishop then must be the blameless, the husband of one wife. And again, that husband of one wife, lots of controversy over that. Vigilant. I think the word vigilant there, let me look it up really quick. I'll just give you an example. Vigilant. Let's just look it up. I know we're at an hour, but that's okay. I just want to, I want to be done with this. Just there's so much going on and swirling around with this that I just wanted to deal with this. I'll just give you an example. Um, vigilant. I, mean, I don't remember the Greek word, so I got to look up the interlinear. Give me a second. Must be vigilant. I think it's this Greek word. Yes. Yes, this Greek word right here, if I can get it to play. Here we go. Strong's G, 3524. 
Nephalios. 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 Now, it's interesting. If you look it up in the interlinear and it gives you an outline of biblical usage, look at what comes up first. Nephalios. Sober, temperate, abstaining from wine, either entirely or at least from its immoderate use. Abstaining from wine entirely. Some people believe a pastor should not drink, and if he drinks, he's disqualified from ministry. There's literally people who believe that. I do not drink in any way, shape, or form. I hate alcohol, and, I've, and, and I would, I'm against alcohol. Forget from a, even a theological perspective. Just because working in the medical world for 22 years, seeing the absolute tragedy and destruction alcohol brings into human life, there's no reason to do. There's no reason to partake. It just seems foolish. But I've seen especially in the reform world, you know, uh, reform pastors literally bragging about the alcohol they're drinking, literally bragging, showing uh, photographs of the, of the, basically the bar they have in their house and they brag about it. Well, what happens if by one chance they drink one night and, and they go from just sober to buzzed? Are they disqualified from ministry? And there's a lot of past, a lot of here that speaks about alcohol. Vigilant seems to have a a reference to alcohol. Sober seems to possibly have, could possibly also be apl- applicable. And then 1 Timothy 3.3, 3, not given to wine. There seems to be a lot of emphasis on alcohol here. Okay, not, that's usually not the emphasis. Well, you, we usually see 1 Timothy 3 and think the emphasis is, is on sexual purity. Not, no, this deals with uh, a lot dealing with alcohol. So how does that work? So I just, I just, I just find it very interesting the way people handle First Timothy three. Just sometimes I think it's not based off sola scriptura. First Timothy three sadly becomes a, a tool that we use to attack the people we don't like, and that's wrong. That's just wrong. That's just wrong. And I think we can all agree with that. And watching the current controversies unfold, I'm seeing a lot of that happening. Hey, this guy, he was, you know, part of the seminary, but he's, he's gone because he was quick-tempered and pugnacious. He's gone. At the same time, well, wait a minute. There's all these things swirling around MacArthur. Does that make him disqualified? No, 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 no. Doesn't apply to MacArthur. Wait, Phil Johnson's over there doxing someone. Ah, no, 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 no. That doesn't, doesn't apply to Phil Johnson. So who does it apply? It applies to everyone outside of MacArthur's circle, but it doesn't apply to anyone within MacArthur's circle. Is that how it works? Now, and again, forget MacArthur. Put it in any circumstance. First Timothy three does not outline specifics on what you do when the rules are violated. Obviously there's the best you have in scripture is the scripture that outlines the rules of confrontation. If there's repentance, it seems to be the end of it. No repentance, bring two or three witnesses. In fact, you we'd even could bring in the scripture. It seems to say against an elder, you're not to take an accusation unless you have two or three witnesses. Do we even follow that? If one person makes an accusation against an elder, is that sufficient to discipline them? Or do you require two or three witnesses? If you cannot get to two to three witnesses, even if you feel like the accusation, the truths have some credibility, are you to accept those accusations? Now, hopefully, if one person brings the accusation against the pastor, and if if it's truth, hopefully the pastor will just admit to it and repent. But I mean, technically, could he say, wait, I'm not dealing with this until you have two or three witnesses. Would that be right or would that be wrong? See, there's there's a lot of scriptures that deal with this. And I just think churches, many cases are not prepared for it. I think churches have to, they, each individual church needs, I think, specific guidelines on what we do and how we work it. And the pastor needs to know that before he's hired. Hey, here's the rules. Here's how they're going to work. Here's what we're going to do. And then the church follows those rules and the pastor submits to those rules because they were agreed upon at the time he became the pastor. I don't think church, many churches have any, they don't even have any real guidelines on what to do. And the next thing you know, someone's like, hey, disqualified, you're disqualified, you're disqualified. Yeah, so there you have it. Hopefully that's beneficial. Ho- I, I Hopefully, I just want to challenge us. My goal here was just to challenge us on how we handle a passage like 1 Timothy 3. And I just think there's a lot of questionable ways in the way it's been handled throughout church history. Not, and, and MacArthur's situation is just one. And you go to the, uh, the uh, Roy's report, you read all of those stories about MacArthur and you can, you can draw your own conclusion. 
I just think sometimes it's it's questionable the way these situations occur, and I think it comes down to to, to demonstrate sometimes we're not as sola scriptura as we claim that we are. All right, I'll stop there. You can give me all your thoughts on this very controversial subject by emailing me at newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. That's newsif at yahoo.com. Again, the MacArthur situation is just being used as an illustration to get us to the deeper topic. You may have all kinds of opinions about the MacArthur situation. You may say, why did you even share it? It's public. It's out there everywhere. It's it's being reported by Julie Roy as a reporter. She's reporting on this. So it's it's public knowledge. I'm just taking it going, hey, this get, I, I've got a deeper question here. When, when does 1 Timothy 3 get used and when does it not get used? Because I see... I see, I see the MacArthur group at Master Seminary using it against the man that was, was let go or resigned because he was quick-tempered and pugnacious, but I don't see the same passage being used to go against some of these accusations and issues surrounding MacArthur Phil Johnson. So it's got to go both ways, right? Hey, these rules are non-negotiable. We can't bend on these rules. So that man at Master Seminary had to go. You can't run or, you know, and it's just, yeah, I mean, we could go all day on, on this. So, but I, here's the reality. MacArthur is a sinner. I'm a sinner. Phil Johnson's a sinner. Julie Roy's is a sinner. Everyone yelling that this man's disqualified and this man's disqualified. The man who stood in chapel and said that that uh, person was disqualified and that's why he resigned. He is a sinner. So everyone sins. And if everyone sins, that's going to put them in every leader sins. And I guarantee you some of those sins would put them in violation of 1 Timothy 3. So what some people say, well, it has to be really big. It has to be really egregious. Okay, well, then you've got to define what big and egregious is so everyone knows now 1 Timothy 3 comes into play. You can't just arbitrarily use it whenever you want to. It just seems, yeah, there's got to be a better way. All right, I'll stop right there. We'll see what happens with this. I, I'm, I'm already worried about posting this, but it's too late. As soon as I hit the stop button, it'll be on YouTube in about three minutes. And about five minutes later, I'm probably already going to start getting comments posted, which clearly demonstrates they didn't actually listen to this hour plus discussion. All right. Everyone have a great day. God bless. Oh, wait. Someone just posted a comment. Okay, Good. Thank you. Thank you. I've sounded good. Hopefully, you know, we'll, we, we won't have any, we won't have any guarantee if this fixes the problem, but we'll, 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 we'll get to that later. Thank you very much, Colton, for that. Um, and when the new microphone uh, gets here, this, hopefully this afternoon, if I come back, hopefully Colton will be around. He's now the official sound man for the, uh, for Victory Baptist Church. Colton is now officially uh, hired to be the sound person of Victory Baptist Church, even though he lives I don't know where he lives, somewhere far away. So, but he's he, he's going to have to relocate his family right here to Ovalo, Texas to take a job as the sound person for Victory Baptist Church and he'll get that big pay like I get. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't get a salary from the church. Yeah. So, uh so the, yeah, there, there you go. Yeah, you can be like me and not get paid. Now, to be fair, my church does make my house payment. So, I do I get paid in that sense, but I don't get a salary. But yeah, so I'm very grateful though that the church, if they didn't make my, if they didn't make my house payment, I would still be a bivocational pastor, which I was, I was for what, 15 years, I think 15 years, 14 years, 12 years. I don't remember how long. So, um, so yeah, but no, we, we, everyone should thank Colton for his help and trying to fix the sound problem. So there you have it. I know that was controversial. And oh man, I don't want to post this. The last time I did this, I deleted it five minutes after. So I'm already tempted to do the same thing, but there you go. Uh, Roy's report, please check it out. Read all of those stories for yourself. And just, I want you to just dig into that. Like, wait, when does 1 Timothy 3 apply? Wait, when does it not apply? When is the person done? When is the person not done? When is permanent disqualification? When is temporary disqualification? How long does it work? Because I think what you're going to see is 1 Timothy 3 and Titus doesn't really outline exactly the process. It's giving you a general list of rules, and that's about it. And we fill in the rest and then act like it's from Scripture. That is the problem I have. All right, stop right there. God bless.